the presentation, the next talk you're going to hear is from Carolina. Oh, I'm going to butcher your last name, Carolina. That's fine. You don't have to say it. I'm going to try anyway. Is y'all Reggie? No. No? So, All right. Uh, so Carolina. Howard, huh? Howard, how are you if you were curious? How Reggie? How are you? All right. Um, Carolina is a PhD candidate at uh, University of California, San Diego, under Professor Alicia Kim. Uh, her work focus, focuses on level set based topology optimization. And as it turns out, one of the real challenges in level set methods, the part that people spend a lot of work on, is hand deriving the hand calculating the derivatives. Um, as best I can tell, in my limited capacity to understand it, it's something akin to a continuous adjoint, but one that's dual consistent. Uh, so a lot of, since so much effort in the level set world goes into com computing those derivatives. Uh, we thought it might be a good idea to look at whether you could leverage some of what OpenMBO has done to make that process a little bit easier. And that's what she'll be talking about. I think they've made some good progress, although I don't think everything has gone completely smoothly. So, Hello. So, as Justin said in his introduction, I'm a PhD student at the University of California, San Diego. Being a PhD student, I'm used to being interrupted all the time, so feel free to interrupt me <laughs> during my presentation. I don't mind. Um, so this is on level set topology optimization in OpenMDAO using Cython. Uh, the bulk of this work was actually done by Dr. Hyung Chung. Um, I'm a little bit new to it as well, so I'll try to answer any questions to the best of my ability. Um, so I will go over a little bit of background on topology optimization for those that aren't very familiar with it. Uh, then the implementation of topology optimization in OpenMDAO, what works well, and then issues that we've encountered, so what doesn't work well, and just some conclusions based off of that. Okay, so what is topology optimization? Um, in the most general sense, what topology optimization is, is basically trying to optimize for the material layout in a particular design domain. And what a design domain is, is just the bounds of where material can be placed. So here, the design domain is basically for the left-hand side for the 2D, it's just this rectangular box. So that's basically saying anywhere in this box, material can be placed. The initial design doesn't have to be completely solid or anything like that. Material can be just placed on certain bits. But what the design domain is, is that here is where any material can be placed if it's needed, if it's helpful for the optimization. And on the right, that's also, that's the design domain for that 3D problem. So the material can be placed anywhere within that particular box. It starts off at the circle, but the domain is that box. And so what's being done here is that we have basically um, clamped on the left-hand side. There's a force in the center on the right-hand side of that beam, cantilever beam. And in the 3D problem, we have that on the left, there is just a clamp condition. And on the right, there is a torsion being applied. And typically, in topology optimization, you're trying to maximize some sort of structural performance. It doesn't always have to be structural performance, but that tends to be the norm in our field. And so what you end up with is the optimized topology, the optimized material layout. So in this 2D example, you have that right here, that's where material should be, and that is what we have optimized for. In the 3D problem, we have a nice little torsion ball. It looks nice because it's 3D. And so for the 3D problem, we have, I think, about 5 million uh, finite elements. So that translates for our optimization to 240,000 design variables. So that's what large scale means to us. And OK, so moving on. Um, for topology optimization, what we are optimizing for is basically material layout. That's what we want. And how you represent that material depends on what sort of method you are using. So there tends to be kind of two main camps in topology optimization. One is density-based. And the, the main density-based method is something called SIMP. Solid isotropic material penalization. It's outside of the scope of this talk what that is, but the point is for density-based optimization, you basically take your design domain 
discretize it into a grid, and then assign densities to each of those elements. So here, if we have a circle and we want it to represent it with a density-based method, that's how it would look like. So in this, uh, I guess, comes up later. So basically, wherever the wherever you're fully within your domain, that's completely solid. If a material is, uh, if one of the elements is partially cut, then they're going to have some sort of intermediate density. And if there is no material there, the density is zero. So that's how material is represented with a density-based method. And then for level set, it's a boundary-based method. It's implicit. So what you have is something called um, a level set function. And where that function is zero, that defines your boundary and that defines your domain. If it's greater than zero, you're inside, and that's where material is. If it's less than zero, you're outside. There's no material there. And so this boundary is what is defining our material. And so in terms of design variables, what that means is that for the density-based method, our design variables are our densities. So each element, how it's been discretized, that is a design variable. So we see at the top that x1, that's for our first element, whatever density that is, zero in this case, that's one design variable, and so on with all of the elements. For level set, what a design variable is, is the boundary, so a discretized boundary. So in the level set case, it's basically these boundary points along, along the boundary. So we have uh, basically here, just all along the boundary, those are now our design variables. How, does, how do we move that boundary to optimize our design? For density-based, how do we optimize those densities of where material is placed? to get the best design. And just a bit of a caveat. So the way that level, the level set method is implemented in topology optimization varies a lot from group to group. So this is how our group uses it. Emphasis on our group. So don't go anywhere else expecting that it'll be the same, because it won't. <laughs> OK, and so one of the things that we found uh, to be kind of important for OpenMDAO, and I'll discuss it in more detail a bit later, is that for the SIMP method, because you have a discretized, you have discretized elements, and those those number of elements are not ever are not really changing typically, the number of design variables is constant. For the level set, because you are changing the boundary and your boundary is what gets discretized with every iteration, you do have a number of design variables that changes with every iteration. OK, so why do we want to use OpenMDAO? As was mentioned before, calculating sensitivities for topology optimization, it can be quite a bit of a process. There's usually some sort of like long hand calculation that is always, there's always issues with it. It's always wrong at first, and then you have to figure out what's wrong with it. It's a whole, it's a whole thing. And that can really be an obstacle for industry. And if industry ever wants to use topology optimization, that's a bit of a turnoff for them. So what we were really interested in was being able to use OpenMDAO's algorithms for calculating derivatives and seeing if that is something that we could use in our framework. So onwards to the implementation. So basically what we did was first try to implement SIMP um, because that is that tends to be easiest to implement. So here's the N2 diagram of what we had done. You basically take your design variables, which are your densities, filter them, penalize them, and then you put them through a finite element analysis that gives you your objective, constraints, go through the optimization, and what was basically our goal was to take our level set method and connect it with OpenMDAO. And we just kind of started with SIMP just as a proof of concept in a sense, just to make sure, OK, can we just do topology optimization at all with OpenMDAO? And since this was the simplest, this is what we went with. Uh, so the finite element analysis, that bit was actually from the code that our lab had developed. 
And so what we needed to do was basically interface with our lab's code and open MDAO in order uh, to get this running. So fun animation graphic. Okay, so how our lab group uses an open source code called OpenLSTO. Uh, so open source. And that is written in C++, OpenMDAO, written in Python. So we needed a way to interface between the two. We went with Cython because it just seemed like a good idea at the time. All right, so with that, using the finite element that we had developed with our code, we were able to interface that with OpenMDAO, and we were able to basically get that topology optimization running. And we were able to basically use just defining the partial derivatives for each of our modules to actually be able to come up with the sensitivity analysis, which was great. It worked. Yay. So then the next step was to actually use our level set topology optimization and try to interface that. So again, this is just how our group does this. The way that our framework works is that you input your problem parameters, so your dimensions, how many elements you want to use, material properties, so on and so forth, and basically how you want to start off your initial geometry. From there, the level set gets discretized, finite element and sensitivity analysis is done. For us, the way that we discretize our level set is with boundary points. So each boundary point ends up being a design variable. Specifically, the velocities or the movement of that boundary point is what we want to optimize for. So that's what the optimization gives us. With that, we're able to update the level set, update the geometry, and eventually, that leads to the optimized design. So that's all written in C++. That link is where you can find an open source version of it, if you're curious. And then to the code that we then use to interface between the two, that's also on GitHub through that link. And so that's kind of something aside that just works in parallel with both our code and OpenMDAO. So what we needed to do was basically go from a density-based method to a boundary-based method. And if you have any familiarity with topology optimization, the two methods, they're very, very different. And so we needed to figure out how can we go from what we've already implemented in OpenMDAO with this density-based method into our level set formulation. And so we found that, funnily enough, OpenMDAO provided a pretty good framework for this. There were a number of components from the SIMP implementation that we could actually use in our level set, which was nice. So reconfigurability and reusability worked out for us. So for the level set module, there were a number of components that we were able to reuse from SIMP, but the main component that we have to change is this level set to SIMP. So basically taking our boundary-based uh, material, being able to convert it into something that was then density-based in order to then run it through OpenMDAO. And this is something specific to how we've implemented it in OpenMDAO. OpenMDAO, it's not how we necessarily always do this, but we did get it working. So um, here's just kind of an example problem. So here, that same by clamp, that clamped cantilever beam that I had shown before, we're trying to maximize structural stiffness. And so we were able, so this is the, so that's our results for the density based implementation and then our results for the level set implementation and kind of one of the things that we like about the level set is that it kind of, it shows a very crisp boundary there isn't any intermediate density so there's no need to try and figure out okay so how does this translate into something that can be manufactured now that there's these gray densities how do we interpret that for the level set it's very obvious where the boundary is so that's what we like about it. So in terms of the issues that we encountered, so what did not work well? One of 
the main issues that we've that I guess we're still dealing with today is the newer versions, which was mentioned before. So once upon a time, this worked fine, and then there was an update, and then it didn't work fine. Story, <laughs> story as old as time. So for us, it was something. Something goes on with the declare partials, and it just it it's angry. I don't. I we haven't quite figured out why. I think it works up to the 2.5 version. It's not angry, and then after that, it's very angry. So, yeah, if you could, if we if we could all look into that, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's something specifically with uh, with just getting the the partial derivatives in order for to get the sensitivities. After that, so I mentioned before that we use Cython in order to talk from in order to convert R. C++ code into something that can be recognized by Python. So that's what Cython is. And we found that there's uh, a bit of a memory issue. So basically, with each iteration, the memory starts growing. And this calls back to what I had mentioned before with the changing design variables. So because an open MDAO, when you give it input variables, it's expecting those, those inputs to stay the same size which doesn't happen for us. So the way that we've worked around that is to basically create that OpenMDAO module and destroy it in each iteration. But what we found is that the memory is not actually being released. So with each iteration, we have increasing memory. Question? We have not. So we've tried. So basically what we've done is basically from Python, we just say delete. Like, right, we use the del command. And we expect that to delete it and release the memory, but that we found that it hasn't. So you see that it's using up 1.86 memory, whatever that is, megabytes, who knows. Um, so we expect that to be released after the del command, but the memory actually stays the same. It's still 1.86. And then you see after 99 iterations that it's it, it's gone up. So. Okay, and so were you using this in Python or did Python. okay? Okay. Okay, that's interesting. I'll definitely have to look into that. So, so yeah, we this is a memory problem that we were experiencing. We weren't sure if it was something that was specific to Cython or whether it was something because of the OpenMDAO module, but we just couldn't get it to delete properly, and it's basically taking up a lot of memory, which is an issue because then it doesn't run. <laughs> so that was our other main issue that we encountered. So... It's not, it's not all bad though. The implementation still works, so it, is use, it can be used for topology optimization. It was really nice to have something that will basically find the sensitivity for you given just that you've done uh, the partial derivatives. So we were able to come up with one impl an implementation of one method and then reuse that for an implementation of another very different method. And then again, the main issues that we encountered were those darn newer versions, and then that memory issue. And yeah, so that's, that's it for my talk. And so I actually want to address that, that error because I, I'm very curious what you all think. And feel free to talk to me offline if you want, or we can discuss it now. But uh, this one? Yeah. So what happened here was in uh, 2.5, we added a function to check for incorrect specification of partial derivatives. Uh, and I think it took us a couple of tries to get the error message right. So later versions might actually give you a more detailed error message. Sure. Brett, to back me up, is that right? Like, we have a better <laughs> error message than that now, I think. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember what the error message is, but we made this a non-default. Like, this is not a default. I thought this was a runtime thing. Anyway, my, here's my point. We added a feature to OpenMDO to check for when you're doing something wrong. 
I'm pretty sure that there's like an actual bug in like how the partials are being specified. <laughs> um, so, so the error message maybe could be better, and I, I think we've improved it, but in like later versions. Actually, now that I'm looking at it in the message more detail, that, that's no longer, we can... Oh, we support that now. We can handle it. Now. Oh, all right, never mind, I'm wrong. Cool. Anyway, my point was, if we add error messages that break your model because you didn't know you were doing something wrong before, but now you do, I would think the community would think that's a good thing, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, in this case, it took us a while to get our act together and get the assembly right, so it, it might be the case where if you jump a version, and maybe we can figure out which, ver well, just jump to the newest version and see. Cross your fingers, I guess. Pray. Okay. <laughs> um. okay. Cool. Any questions, comments, concerns? Yep. So, uh, two problems with being there. Uh, so, you're, because the, the design variable count is changing every time you're creating and deleting an open MDAO instance every, every design iteration, correct? Okay. Uh, so, the question was because the design variables are changing, am I creating and deleting an open MDAO module each iteration? The answer is yes. Okay. That is happening. So then, so you're driving it at the top level using some outside optimizer. You're not using Open MDAO's optimizer driver. Yeah. Okay. Maybe at the um, Open MDAO there is a, a reconfiguration feature, but it's not really documented, I think. So uh, Remy is talking about. There is some capability in OpenMDAO, at least clan capability, to support reconfiguration. John Huang actually did some early work on that. Uh, it was a prototype, and we have never explicitly, it doesn't work anymore. We haven't tested it enough, and we, if, if that's a feature that is valuable, like at, at what point that raises to the level that we're going to implement it, we're going to have to go back and take a hard look at it. Uh, we've, we've made some tiptoe efforts into that, like um, Rob, Fault, but I don't know if you'll show it, but he's done some work where he's called setup more than once on the problem. I'm messing up the video because nobody can hear me. Uh, so we've, we've sort of stuck our toe into that lake, but um, the changing of variable sizes is not supported at the moment. So I, I think they actually have to create an entire new problem, like, like wipe out the problem instance and reinstantiate it. Uh, on the flip side, we've done a ton of work to make our setup process more efficient. I think several times we've like gotten a 10x improvement um, so the need to reconfigure may be less. It may not be so much overhead to just reinstantiate the problem anymore. Um, obviously, that's going to be very problem specific. Yes. So if we have an asymmetric grid, you're asking, does that then affect the number of design variables that they don't have to change? Yeah, so you have the same types of diagram, there's no isometric rectangular dimension. Uh-huh. You could have a axis dimension with the same type of diagram, then your design variables are more along the radius. So then you don't have to change the number of design variables. I see. Okay, so so basically, rather than having a regular rectangular mesh, to just have one where the rather than the design variables being discretized along this, there's already something that's discretizing it, and then as it changes, you just follow that. I see. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to process check. This is a very good question about details of level set method. Out of scope for most of the uh, for most of the audience, but uh, encourage you guys to talk about it at lunch. <laughs> yeah. So there's yeah. So there's a number of details about the level set method that was not included in a 15 minute presentation, which is was all of them basically. So <laughs> the way the levels so the level set method is something that exists on its own. It's started off as a front tracking method a lot for basic, I think um, specifically like fluid problems is what it was used in a lot. 
So it was then implemented in topology optimization, but the way that many of those algorithms have been used and implemented are for regular meshes, so regular rectangular meshes. So there's not a lot of algorithms for the level set method that can actually use something in different coordinate systems. So I don't know if that answers your question, but if not, I'll be here during lunch. Yep. Um, very, very good job.